good to see you all. I wonder, um, just to scan the audience here, um, I'm going to make some of you a little uncomfortable here. So how many of you in the room, raise your hand, are married? Raise your hand real proud. It's a lot of married people. All right. You can put it down. You welcome single people. Now you know who's married and who's not. Good job. So, so here's the thing. I didn't get paid for that, but, but I, I do want now, if you are here with your spouse, raise your hand again. All right. Now you're trapped. So now I want all of you to stand real quick. Okay? So stand up because I have a question for the husbands. Okay? And, and here's, here's the question. I want you to to, to, as you answer this question, I want everyone else to just look at the wives, okay? So here's your question. Yes, sweetie, I'm coming over. <laughs> I just started sweating. Okay, so here's, here's the question. As you answer this question, you have to gaze into each other's eyes, okay? So I want husbands, I want you to pray for godly wisdom, Orlando, Pray for godly wisdom. Okay, so now, here we go. Look, look, don't, don't look at Deborah and I, because I'm not sure what's going to happen here. But you look at your wives. Husbands, have you, smart, smart, back up a little bit. Husbands, raise your hand if you have ever in your marriage, from the wedding day till present day, if you have ever won an argument, raise your hand right now. Uh, okay. Now, there, you can be seated. Thank you. So here's the thing. I, I warned you, the few of you that raised your hand, I warned you. So, so what's going to have to happen here, Pastor Juan, Pastor Justin, there are going to be a couple of men here that need ride homes. So that, that's going to be clear that that's going to happen here. So, so that's good. Most of you were, were, had wisdom, kept your hand in your pocket, and saying, I'm not moving this thing anywhere. So, so here, here's the thing. So over the years in ministry, I have this amazing um, part of my ministry is kids grow up in my area of ministry. They want to get married. And, um, and I don't know, they come to me and say, hey, we would love for you to do premarital counseling. And I'm like, yeah, I'd be honored. That'd be great. And so one of the areas that we talk about, it's a major area, is conflict resolution. Conflict resolution. It's some of the questions that, that we talk about is, is, well, how do you resolve conflict when it disrupts the relationship? How do you treat each other in the midst of controversy? How do you respond to one another when there is what we call intense fellowship, okay? And then how do we forgive and then forget? Those are good questions. Now, I won't put any married couple on the platform, but one of these days, if for a comedy central show, we will do that up here and see what answers come out. But there are times that, another thing is there are times that manipulation, Guilt trips, judging up the past just to prove a point doesn't always resolve the conflict. It actually never resolves the conflict when you use that. So what does all this have to do with church? What does all this have to do with what we've been answering, the question of what is church and the church in action as we started moving into and so, here's what it has to do with. Every single one of you are a part of a body of believers. Every single one of you. And you are involved in a marriage. Because you belong to the bride of Christ. Every single one of us. From Isaiah to Revelation, there is all this conversation of the bride of Christ and the groom and the second coming and what's going to happen during that. So you are involved in a marriage. And every marriage, I don't care who it is, has conflict. So I've had kids over the years come and, and tell me, like, oh, Pastor Mario, you, you and Miss Deborah have just the perfect marriage. 
And I will tell you this, honestly, we're about 50% perfect. 50% perfect. We've got a long way to go. But we're about 50% perfect. Would that be about accurate? About 50%? Yeah, okay. So, so, but much like in the same way a married couple must resolve conflict in a Christ-like way, so the church has to resolve conflict in the same manner. And so we're at a place in the middle of the first century where the gospel is spreading rapidly. And we have the very first church conflict that takes place. And it happened in the church of Antioch. And so what was this conflict about? We'll get to that in a second. But when Satan can disrupt, blur, confuse, distract Christians from the mission of God, which is spreading the gospel, he cannot be more gleeful if he can do that. What is distracting us from the mission of God? So just remember that. So what was this controversy about? So I'm going to talk to the men here in the room, okay? So the controversy came up, and I want you to pretend, okay, if you're a man in the audience from, let's just say, teenager, 16 on up, um, let's just pretend for a second that none of the men in, in, in the audience here are Christian, okay? You're, none of you are Christian. And you're working out in your yard, and your neighbor comes by. You've never really talked to your neighbor, sort of a new neighbor, but your neighbor comes by and says, hey, neighbor, how are you? My name's such and such. And uh, need some help? Oh, I'm good. Nah, let me help you. And your neighbor starts to help you. But he does this weekly. And he's a nice guy. And let's just say you go to work. And you have a colleague that is just, man, what is going on with this colleague? They're just so, so nice and they're courteous. Maybe it's your boss. And your boss treats everyone fairly and they're kind. They affirm you. And, and, and you're like, what is going on? And you start to get to know your neighbor, and you start to get to know your colleague. You start to get to know your classmate of these people that, man, there's something about them that's different. And as you spend time with them, you discover they're a Christian. They're a follower of Jesus. And you ask them over a cup of coffee, or, they're, or at, you invite them over to the house, and you're talking to them during your lunch break, and they say, you ask them, saying, hey, tell me your story. Okay. And the person tells you how they came to Jesus. And you're moved by that as a non-Christian. And you're like, oh, wow. And that impacted your life. Yeah. I would love, and they, they invite you. They, I would love to invite you to, they're Forest Lake Church member. I would love to invite you to Forest Lake Church. I'd love for you to be a part of my church spiritual family. Ah, I'm not really ready for that. But then a couple years go by. And all of a sudden, it's the right place. Your soul is searching. You're like, okay. And you're still hanging out with your neighbor. You, they still treat you with, with love and respect. And, and they tell you things that God's doing in their life. And, and, and you ask questions. And then you come to church and all of a sudden, hey, you feel the Spirit of God move in your life for the first time. And you want to get baptized. Okay? So here here's, comes the controversy of what's happening in, in the early church. And so I want all men to stand up, okay? I'm going to give you exercise today. All men stand up. Come on, don't be, don't be ashamed. Here's the controversy, okay? So all of you have been coming to church. All of you just, oh my goodness, you know, the impact of what Jesus has done in their life. And, and, and you commit to say, I want to be baptized. And so... Let's just pretend, unchristian, and, 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 and you're giving your life to God. You want to be baptized. A group of elders come and knock on your door. And they walk in. And here was the controversy of the church of Antioch. And they say this. Hey, we love that you're coming to our church. We love that you're a part of the church family. And we've heard that you're wanting to get baptized but in order for you to receive salvation, we're here to circumcise you. Okay, sit down if you're comfortable with that. I mean, or, or, or sorry, if you're uncomfortable with that, sit down. Yeah, there you go. It's confused you a little bit. Okay, so 
there you have it. So that was the awkwardness of what was happening in the church of Antioch. And this was a controversy that Paul and Barnabas were really upset that this is what was happening, and they argued against that. And so here's the crazy thing, is that a group of Judeans showed up, well-meaning Judeans showed up, and they started pressing these new converts to all of a sudden get circumcised at all ages. Oh, if you want salvation, yeah, if you want to receive salvation, this is what you must have to do. So, this would have been a huge stumbling block, as you just experienced. No, that's a little uncomfortable for me. Okay, this would have been a huge stumbling block for the Gentiles. And here in chapter 15, verse 6, we talk about how this issue went all the way back to Jerusalem to the elders and to the apostles to discuss this very important issue that had just come up, what do we do with this? And so we're going to talk about church conflict and how to deal with church conflict because it will come. It has come. It's always here. But we're going to talk about how did the early church deal with it. So, verse 6. Here we go. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. So this group was called the Jerusalem Council, by the way. And they met together to address this disagreement. And, and they could not afford to ignore this dispute because the implications was far beyond the church of Antioch if they decided, yes, we're going to keep to the traditions of Jewish traditions and enforce this. So how they resolved it, it's an example for us today. So as they were discussing this controversy, Peter, I love Peter, he's the first dude to always stand up. And he stood up and he started testifying. And this is what Peter said in verse 7. He said, brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Remember a couple months ago, we talked about this crazy dream that Peter was having. And God said, all of these animals that you're seeing in your dream, you can eat. They're all clean. And then God gave somebody else a vision. His name was Cornelius. It was a Gentile. And so he showed up to Cornelius' house, preached the gospel. And then all of a sudden, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit fell upon Gentiles. And they were speaking in tongues. <gasps> to Gentiles? And this happened. And this is what Peter is talking about. So he says, God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit. Just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them. For he purified their hearts with what? By faith. By faith, he is setting up the doctrine of salvation right here, which Paul continues the doctrine of salvation through all of his teachings, throughout all of his, all of his epistles. And so then, he did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts. Now then, why do you try to test God? By putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke. What is a yoke? We'll talk about that that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. The yoke he's talking about was the law. We couldn't fulfill them. Our ancestors couldn't fulfill it. Why would you want to put it around the necks of these new converts? And then here in verse 11, I think, is probably the most powerful statement in this whole chapter. It is the doctrine of salvation all in one sentence. He says, no, we should not do that. We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved. Just, oh, this is beautiful. Just as they are. Did you hear that correctly? Because there was hardly any amens to this amazing truth. That just as you are, we're right where you're sitting. No matter what you did last night, no matter what you do this tomorrow, 
or the next day or 10 years or what you did this morning on your way to church. Just as you are, Jesus approves of you. And not only approves of you, by through faith, he gives you salvation. Just as you are. There's nothing you can do about it. If you have spiritual insecurity and you're embarrassed and you're ashamed of your past because of something you did five years ago, five days ago, five minutes ago, this text is something not only to be read but to be memorized, to listen to the truth and forget listening to the lies of Satan so that you have to feel that whenever Satan says, oh, you remember when you did this? You should feel horrible. So the law couldn't save the Jews. Only the grace of Jesus could. And how absurd was it that the Jews wanted to impose the same legalistic requirements that they themselves could not fulfill? It's crazy. But it was only by grace through faith that we are saved. There is no one here in this room who is capable of earning salvation and righteousness on their own. If that were possible, there would be no need for the cross of Jesus. If that were possible. Paul reiterated this point throughout his letters. One of my favorites. For it is by grace you have been saved. Through what? Through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's a, a gift. Much better than Christmas. Because it's every day. It's every minute. It's every second. It's a gift. Something that you can't earn. Something you don't deserve. It's a gift. It's not by works. Because, hey, you're bragging about your holiness. Mm-mm. It's not your holiness. It's Christ's holiness. So the doctrine of salvation was birthed in the early church to combat the idea of I must do something to earn my salvation. It doesn't exist. It's a lie. So what could have been a major breach in the church became an opportunity for leaders to focus on what the mission of God really was, which was to spread the gospel at the time. And too often, churches are ripped apart by these disputes, different types of disputes. We're not going to go into those disputes that a lot of us might know about, because I don't want your mind to go there, because it's a distraction from the mission of God. And see, these disputes sometimes become the focal point, and they distract us. Just like a marriage, if the controversy is not addressed, it becomes a festering wound. And so the church had to deal with this because it would have crippled the early church and the advancement of the gospel. So the church leader drafted up this letter. And they drafted up this letter to the, the church of Antioch. And they wrote a letter to these people who were new converts. And they said this, verse 24, greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed. We all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, which you already know. Men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas as not only eyewitnesses, but we're sending them to you to let them know what we discussed here at the Jewish council. And verse 28 is golden. Because this ties a bow on everything. This ties a bow on the fact that well, how was this whole thing discussed? Was there intense debate? Was there chairs being flung across the room? Was there personal insults? Was there people, I'm leaving the church? What kind of conversation was it? This kind of gives us a window into that. And so then verse 28 says, it seemed good to the Holy 
Spirit. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit. See, we now know that it was more than just a conversation, a debate, or a conflict. Because it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was center stage in the conversation. And this means this, that there was no room for arrogance, there was no room for selfish ambition, and there was no room for destructive behavior. Because a lot of that kind of stuff happens when the Holy Spirit isn't present and center stage. There was a unified and clarified focus on the mission of God, which was to continue to spread the gospel. So it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with, a, with anything beyond the following requirements. And there were four requirements. Okay, and you're going to find out that these four requirements are not requirements or steps to salvation, but there are more requirements for peaceful living with other Christians. You are to abstain from food, sacrifice to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Again, obeying these requirements was not a pathway to salvation, since salvation comes through the grace of Jesus Christ alone. But by avoiding these things, Gentile Christians could set themselves apart from other Gentiles as followers of Jesus. And, real importantly, is they could live in peace and unity with Jewish Christians. The whole sexual immorality part, I won't go into that. Too many little kids here. But there was religious festivals that sexual immorality was involved that would probably put shame on Las Vegas if we went into describing what these religious festivals were in that culture. And Paul and Barnabas and the whole group of the Jewish council said, stay away from these things so that there is an identifiable group of Gentiles that are in the culture that everyone knows, oh, they must be followers of Jesus and it will keep the peace of fellowship amongst the Jewish Christians as well. So how a church responds to such disputes determines whether or not the church is able to continue to effectively carry out God's mission. Again, when Satan can disrupt, blur, confuse, or distract Christians from spreading the gospel, he cannot be more delighted. So now you know why we have a lot of conflict sometimes in churches. It's how we deal with it, though. God desires that we disciple all people and reach the lost instead of focusing on the trivial things that hinder the fellowship and the mission of God. It's all distractions that come our way. And the church of all organizations in the world, the church should be showing the world when there is controversy, when there is arguments, when there's disagreements and conflict that could cripple the mission of God, we as a church put our egos, our personal agendas, and our insatiable need to be right to the side and allow the Holy Spirit to take center stage and the Holy Spirit will always focus us on God's mission. It will always be about people for God. Reaching His people. Reaching the lost. That will always be his focus. Satan's constantly trying to distract us from that. See, people in the church 
can be vicious. Some of the deepest wounds in people's lives are from other church people, from church leaders. We've got to change that. Understand that God chooses the church, the very thing that contains the people who hurt, wound, and divide. He chooses the church to be his bride. Please don't confuse the the bride of Christ with the people who create dissension and division. This needs to be a place that, hey, we can disagree. We can argue. We can have conflict. But as an individual and corporately as a body of believers are we seeking God with our whole heart mind and soul and being so saturated with the Holy Spirit that it just permeates out of us that when these types of things come up when conflict arises all parties turn to Jesus and seek God as the solution It's a tough conversation, but the early church dealt with it, and the Holy Spirit was center stage. So I leave you with this question. Because there's somebody in this room that at some point has had serious conflict with somebody else within the body of Christ. So here's a challenge question. The next time you find yourself at odds with others in your church about an issue, and there's a lot of issues these days. Go play on social media for a little bit. It's a great distraction. But how do we behave towards each other? How do we treat each other? Even if you disagree. The next time you find yourself at odds with others in your church about an issue how will you allow the Holy Spirit to take center stage to deal with this situation how will you do it or will you do it it's a choice but again if you are seeking God with your whole heart and corporately we are doing that together anything could arise from the church and God's mission will always prevail when the Holy Spirit takes center stage in our lives and in our conversations. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, there is so much distraction of what Satan wants to do to take us away from the purpose that you have for your church to declare your glory to the world to shine your love on the lost to accept those who are far from you and to love them back to you but internally sometimes Lord there's bickering there's disagreements there's conflict there's personalities There's head clashing. And sometimes that can get harsh. And sometimes that can become wounding. And I pray that you will work on our hearts individually, Lord, that whenever that does come up and we're present, that you will always take the center stage of the conversation, the center stage of our heart, where there is no place for egos, there is no place for personal agenda. There is no need to be right. But the greatest need is that people are loved and know Jesus. So we pray this in your name, Lord. Amen.